I'm Matt Evers, a professional skater and lover of winter sports. Now the highlight for anyone passionate about winter sports has to be the Winter Olympics. It is a 17-day, action-packed, adrenaline-fueled competition. But you don't have to be an Olympic hopeful to get a taste for the ice and snow. Where can you witness flying chicken salads, UFOs, and rusty trombones? No, it's not a joke. It's actually one of the high-octane events of the Winter Games, snowboarding. And here at Val Thorens, high up in the French Alps, is where the professionals come to train. There are five snowboarding events in the Winter Olympics, slalom and giant slalom, cross, and the two freestyle competitions, halfpipe and slope style. These are the ones where you'll find board grabs and spins with crazy names. There may be at times a little friction between traditional skiers and the more rock and roll snowboarder, but the two do have common links. The first snowboard was built by fusing two skis, and modern freestyle skiers were inspired by snowboarders' tricks. But the sport owes more to surfing and skateboarding than perhaps skiing. Snowboarders simply adapted the tricks to the snow. Inevitably, this meant constructing obstacles on the mountain to jump, slide, or skim over. Needless to say, this didn't go down well with skiers, and soon specialist snow parks were built to keep the trick borders away from the main trails. This paved the way for the development of a new generation of pro winter sports. A key skill in snowboarding is the ability to ride switch when a boarder changes which foot is forward. To help, they use a curved tailboard to make smoother transitions. This is essential in the half pipe when competitors try to get maximum height, or air, to perform extreme stunts. The more audacious the trick, the higher the chances of getting an Olympic gold. So half pipe is, like you said, a half pipe. And then you have to go and just jump in the pipe and make the best tricks all over each side, um, it's very, very spectacular. You, on the TV, it seems quite flat, but when you're in the pipe, it's huge. You, you watch the, just the, the wall there, maybe six meters higher than you, so it's huge. You've got also a smaller board than this, but soft binding. No timing, of course. The thing is to go high, and of course, the style. It's just an amazing discipline. It's quite technical. You need a lot of engagement, and then you, you need to be as good as a gymnast, I would say. Then slope style is set to push the boundaries even further. Snowboarding that's off-piste through powder is where riders have the most fun. Slope style is the new Olympic event which aims to recreate off-piste challenges with obstacles and jumps. Slope style, it's like freestyle. So you've got a shorter board, like this, around. Same bindings, soft boots, and it's a little bit softer. And then you have bumps, different kind of bumps and rails and all over the slope, so it's quite long. And you have just to play with all the bumps and the, the little rail and, and try to, to make the big tricks. In slope style, there is no, no timing. It's just the judge at the end of the at the slope that will give you a note with the, the air you're going to take, with the tricks you will have to do, you will have done. The, um, if you put a hand in the snow, that's a bad thing. And they will just judge the technical things. I love snowboarding because it's really um, like a game. You know, skiing is a sport and, and you can play much more with snowboard, I think. You won't go as fast in, ski, in snowboarding than skiing, but it's different, a different way of sliding and riding, and it's very fun. New tricks or old tricks, snowboarders continue to set a benchmark on developing new techniques, and long may it continue. A quick skate at the local ice rink at Christmas time gets more popular every year. 
It's super fun, but incomparable to the technique and maneuvers of pro skaters. This rink in Maribel was part of the 1992 Winter Olympics in Albertville, but competitive figure skating goes back a lot further than that. Figure skating was one of the inaugural events at the first ever Winter Games in 1924. It actually featured as an event in two Summer Olympics prior to that, and remains one of the most entertaining and popular sports in the competition today. Skating has come a long way since the animal bone blades dating back as early as 3000 BC. Now, skates have steel edges that give the skater maximum control and speed. The figure skating boot is nothing like that of a hockey skate or a speed skate. It actually was designed after dance shoes and has been modified ever since. As you can see here on this tip of the blade, that's called the toe pick, and it's used for jumps and spins. If we have a look at the blade, you'll see that it's hollowed out into two separate edges, not like a kitchen knife. This is essential to execute the tricks, as skaters use both the outside and the inside edges. This jump is called a double toe loop. You use the toe pick to take off and land on the same backward outside edge. It's a double, as there are two mid-air revolutions. I get asked all the time what the most difficult trick to learn is, and I think for anybody starting off, it's just standing up. But for a competitive skater, it has to be a quadruple jump. I mean, can you imagine jumping up in the air, spinning around four times, and landing backwards on a kitchen knife on ice? Another common question is, do skaters get dizzy? And the short answer is yes. But your body learns how to adjust to it. And to get to a level to where you're able to perform 25 rotations pulling 1.5 Gs takes years and years of practice. There are three figure skating styles in the Olympics, ice dancing, pair skating, and single skating. And they all demonstrate magnificent gliding skills. The reason people love ice dancing is that it's theatrical. You get to pick your own music, do your own choreography, and really tell a story. Plus, it's about the footwork. Pair skating, which is my personal favorite, is all about the overhead throws, the jumps, the spins. And then in single skating, well, it's just about you. I love just speed, and I feel quite free when I skate. I like little bird. I um, just love them, feel the air in my my hair, just feel myself and feel free. Well, it goes without saying that I am a massive fan of the sport of figure skating. And to me, skating is the closest thing to flying. As a kid, and probably still today, all I ever wanted to be was Superman. So, this is probably going to be the closest I'm ever going to get. I'm in Belle-Turenne in the Savoie Mont Blanc region of the French Alps. Now for anyone that loves a bit of skiing action, this is an incredible playground with links to over 600 kilometers of pistes. The Winter Olympics are dominated by skiing with seven of the 15 sport disciplines being contested on skis. These days, skiers can reach dizzying speeds, but it wasn't always that way. Around 7,000 years ago, the first crude skis were created by Scandinavian hunters and soldiers to navigate across snow-covered countryside. By the 1800s, this survival tool evolved into a downhill activity that is enjoyed by millions of people all across the globe. Skiing is a great pleasure just to go for, uh, you can ski for holidays, it's a uh, ski you, you can ski all your life, from two, three years old to 18, 90 years old if you want. Uh, it's a great ski, it's a great sport you can do with your family. You can go uh, just do a few runs, uh, have a lunch, a meal and a beer uh, on, the, on the terrace on top of the mountain. And uh, now it's really uh, that part of skiing I enjoy. 400 million ski passes are sold every year. And despite the risks, downhill runs have proven to be the most popular ski recreation. It's so familiar, in fact, that it's easy to forget how technically challenging this professional sport really is. To become a top skier, you must begin very young. And after a while, it's a combination of different elements. You must have a top mental. You must be in a physical shape. 
you must have a fantastic uh, technique and you must train a lot. The pros may make it seem effortless, but imagine trying to keep control when hurtling down the piste at over 80 miles an hour. This is the goal for downhill and super giant, otherwise known as super G, slalom skiers, who navigate through gates to see who can reach the end of the slope in the fastest time. You must have the top capacity of um, running very nice curve in a very high speed. And with um, sometimes the slope are very difficult, very icy, bumpy. To raise those top speed, it's, uh, it's a great, it's an amazing feeling because you can go uh, as fast as you want. Sometimes you're 140, 150 kilometers per hour, so it's really fast. <laughs> the trees are really going fast uh, on the side of you. And you, sometimes you jump 60, 80 meters. So it's like flight. It's, uh, it's crazy, but it's really good because you're alone on the slope. You feel really free. There are slower speed slalom events, but even in these, competitors top out at over 50 miles an hour. Then the focus is more on control and technique to make the tighter turns. This truly is knee crunching stuff. There is only so much protective gear can do when meeting solid ground at these incredible speeds. So runs for slalom and downhill are carefully constructed to keep the skiers safe. As you can see, the run is quite smooth, and the people behind me here are actually just inspecting the course for any debris, because if you can imagine a skier hitting a rock or a branch at these incredible speeds, it would spell disaster. And just over in the distance, those safety nets, they're called spill zones, and they catch any fallen competitors. Each race is very specific. The weather is specific. The condition of snow are specific. The race, the run is specific. It's a question of adaptation, motivation, and the willing of winning. <laughs> to win the Olympic gold was, uh, was amazing. It's even difficult to explain what I felt that, uh, that day. Uh, it gave me goosebumps, and just to think about it now, I, I, I have them back again. All right, well, I think these runs are a notch or two above what I'm comfortable with. Tempting though it is, I think I shall leave it to the pros. I need a drink. I'm off to the bar. Most people prefer to watch ice hockey than to take part. Don't be fooled by the goofy trick names. These feats take immense skill and precision to master. I'm Matt Evers, a professional skater and lover of winter sports. Now the highlight for anyone passionate about winter sports has to be the Winter Olympics. It is a 17-day, action-packed, adrenaline-fueled competition. But you don't have to be an Olympic hopeful to get a taste for the ice and snow. Now I'm headed to Patinoir Olympique in the Savoie Mont Blanc region of France, which is home to a winter sport that is not for the faint-hearted. With vulcanized rubber flying through the air at 120 miles per hour to razor-sharp blades and legal punching, most people prefer to watch ice hockey than to take part. This rink built for the 92 Albertville Olympics is actually in the ski resort of Maribel. Now it's home to hockey club Val Vanois. The first official rules for ice hockey were written in Montreal in 1873, and it's been Canada's most popular sport ever since. But it was actually here in France where the International Ice Hockey Federation was formed in 1908. First things first, this is not a sport you can just strap on the skates and go. All of this has to go on first. All right, well, let's start with the skates. As you can see, the figure skate is a lot different to the hockey skate. The hockey skate does not have a toe pick, and the boot itself is a lot more rigid. All right, let's get kitted up and go. I had no idea how much prep went into just getting on the ice. I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to stand, let alone skate. All right, let's see how this goes. Oh my God. Well, I'm used to my figure skates, and it feels like somebody shaved my toe picks off. Lord have mercy on my soul. And I hope the pro will have mercy on me too. You must be Quentin. 
Yeah, nice how to meet you. How are you? I'm Matt. Nice to meet you. Fine. Now, I've been told that you are going to teach me how to do the perfect slap shot. Yeah, yeah exactly. For the slap shot, you have to put the, the puck between your two legs, like this. OK. You take a stick like this, one, one hand here on the top, yeah. one in the middle, and hit there, just before the puck. A slap shot is the hardest shot you can learn and sends the puck flying at high speeds. The pros knock it about at over 100 miles per hour. You need real control to perform this on ice, and I'm really missing my toe picks. OK, 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 you thought that was me out there, right? Well, I'll take that as a compliment. But it's time to watch the experts play. Red and blue lines divide the rink into zones that help the referee judge a play. To win the game, it's simple. Score the most goals by whacking the puck into the net. Well, that's the theory. In reality, it's far more brutal. Add to that, it's the fastest team game in the Olympics, and you start to appreciate how demanding this game is. Here in 92, something happened that only a Hollywood movie director could dream of. A unified team made up of six of the former Soviet states got together and competed under the Olympic flag and snatched gold from the favorite, Canada, in a surprising and thrilling final. Well, I know I was fairly rubbish, but after having a go today, I think I've caught the bug for hockey. It's no wonder why there's over 1.6 million players worldwide in this Olympic sport. I'm in the Savoie Mont Blanc region of the French Alps, which is home to some of the best skiing in Europe. Back in 1992, nearby Albertville hosted the Winter Olympics, which is where freestyle skiing became an Olympic event. Freestyle skiing is all about gravity-defying creativity. Athletes flout danger to perform stunts and tricks mid-air whilst hurtling down mountains or kicking off obstacles to perform bigger, braver, and ultimately higher value routines. It wasn't always this acrobatic, though. Legendary pioneer Stein Erikson became skiing's first superstar in the 50s and is credited for giving the sport its air. He combined his gymnastic background with his competitive Olympic talent and made history with his somersault on skis. This was quite popular with their recreational skiers and the style quite literally took off. Don't be fooled by the goofy trick names like the Lincoln Loop, Flare in the Pipe, and the Alley Oop. These feats take immense skill and precision to master and took a long time to be recognized as an official sport. The jumps in the first official mogul run hosted here in 1992 were nothing in comparison to what we see today. Over the years, they've grown taller and steeper to allow for more elaborate tricks and inevitably new and exciting events. Ski cross, downhill racing over obstacles, is one of the most popular and chaotic competitions in freestyle. There's nothing better than watching people go head to head. With alpine racing, you're going looking at, people are looking at timed runs, you kind of have to know what's going on. Whereas ski cross, they can look at it, see people crashing, see people going wide, like lots of things happening, jumping, going for the line. And ultimately, it's... first one across the finish line, win. There's a kind of few myths about the sport, it's not full rugby on skis. However, it does, it, does, <laughs> it does have a little bit of that, but you're not like deliberately allowed to kind of like grab each of Rawi and stuff. A lot of the time, you know, some of the big jumps are, are really intimidating. You, you can come up to them and you, you see them for the first time. You think, that's, that's pretty big, um, you know. Yes, I'm excited, but I am scared. I was an alpine racer, so, you know, I, I raced downhill and it was really fast, like up to 90 miles an hour. So, you know, I, I was kind of used to speed and, and adrenaline and I moved over to ski cross and I was like, this is terrifying. You know, I, I'd never had anything like it before. Uh, but, you know, I think that kind of adrenaline kind of 
fuels you. Fear. And, yeah, <laughs> fear. It really, it really fuels you. And some people can go either way. You know, they can kind of come back a wee bit from it and be a bit intimidated, or you can just go for it, which is, I guess, what, what we try yeah. to do. Yeah, so. and, and the safest way to do it as well. To win nowadays, uh, what you need is uh, you need a lot of fitness. You need really good fitness. Our last race in Canada. Uh, was a minute 45 long, so it was it was really long for us, wasn't it? With all the jumps and everything, and you're doing loads and loads of runs a day, so uh, you need that. You need a really good start. You need to be strong throughout the start. The fastest thing is the snow, so the more we're on the snow, the better. We don't want to be in the air all that long, so it's kind of like the old Eddie the Eagle jumps and looking cool in the air is kind of not, yes. not the big thing. It's all about kind of like getting the skis down, so there's lots of technique with that. Speaking from experience, when you combine speed with gymnastics, the margin for error is tiny. Add to that the fact you're doing it on ice or snow, and the danger levels go through the roof. These are really brave athletes who always push the boundaries, and that's what makes winter sports so great to watch.